take 58. So I had a question this evening that uh, I kind of figured deserved its own video um, because it's a real important one and it's a real good one. Uh, Thomas Ballou, I uh, apologize if I mispronounce your last name, but um, you had a good question. You, you were asking if whether I had uh, if I had building plans and cut sheets available for this building. I'm, I apologize, I do not. I'm doing this out of my head. The only thing I do have written down are my load calculations. But that being said, I do plan to put together a good set of plans on this as well as a cut sheet and a how-to for each of the more technical joints that aren't so cut and dried. And I'll be throwing those on the website at some point. I apologize, it was probably not going to happen until this thing's done in 50 years. But uh, anyway, but tying along with Thomas's question, um, for you guys looking to build something like what I'm doing here, I think it's important that you know there may be a few things that are going to make your structures different than what I'm building, okay? So, I kind of want to go down the list a little bit of some of the basic things that you need to know before you even decide, before you even cut a timber. Let's, let's go that way. What you need to know before you cut a timber for your timber frame. So we're going to go with the engineering side of it. Now, most of us are not engineers. A lot of this you can figure out, but we're going to say it up front, there's no replacement for an engineer approval. And I'm not saying all engineers are brilliant because they're not all brilliant, but if you're not confident that you can design something like this safely and not have it come down on your head or your family's head while you're in the middle of it, don't please do not design it yourself. Please have a timber framing engineer like Fire, fire Tower Group or somebody like that who can look at your plans and approve them and make sure everything is going to be safe. That's the whole idea. We just we want these things safe. I was I felt confident engineering this myself because I built so much stuff over the years and I spent so much time reading and looking and everything else that I could find on this stuff. I'm I'm talking years. I spent years. I know this is my first project, but I have a lot of research under my belt and a lot of what works and what doesn't work as far as the theory goes. Now I'm putting the practice or the theory into practice and translating it from here into my hands. Um, so, but I chose a very simple design. I kept this design so simple just so that it would be easy for me to figure out for my first time. Um, it's bigger than what I should have gone probably for my first try. You know, I didn't even build a set of timber frame sawhorses before. I, I just kind of. I grabbed my mill, I got my logs, and I just said to hell with it, I'm just going to run with it. And that's what I've been doing. But with that said, you know, it does take a little longer sometimes because maybe you didn't foresee everything that you were going to need, which happened to me. You know, you, you get a load of logs, you think, all right, that'll do the whole damn build. And then you're like, oh boy, I have one and a half bent standing here and I need more logs. So stuff like that to consider. But anyway, I digress. The first thing you need to know if you're designing your own frame, again, remember, do not do it unless you're comfortable with this. And there's no replacement for an engineer. I've said it now. Now I'm safe. Nothing can come back on me or on your own guys, you know. I just threw your asses right under the bus. But, uh, so anyway, a few things you need to figure out if you're going to design your own frame. You need to figure out what your intended use for this structure is going to be. Is it going to be your living space? Is it going to be your shop? Just something pretty to look at? That's all very important to know. Once you have an idea of what you're going to use this space for, then you can start figuring your load calculations. <clears throat> and your load calculations are very important. If you don't do those right, this thing could fail on you. And it could be catastrophe. So just keep that in mind. This has to be done right. You're looking for live loads, which are going to be the loads that are going to change. So snow load, um, say like I'm putting a, I'm putting a wood shop and a timber shop on the second floor of this thing. So my live load is going to fluctuate. I may have 10, 20 timbers up there, you know, sitting on the floor. That's a lot of weight. So you have to figure for that. You have to engineer your building. You have to be able to foresee what you plan on using this thing for down the road and in the future. So that's why 
that's why you see tie beams that are so big on this. That's why you see 5 by 8 floor joists. It just, everything is large because I plan on using that second floor with some pretty heavy loads on it. But, when you start to design your frame, once you figure out what you're using it for, once you have a kind of an idea what some live loads and some dead loads are, snow weight on your roof, that's another live load. That's important. So, now we know what a live load is, so we can move on to the dead loads. The dead loads are going to be the loads on your structure that do not change. They're there forever. We're talking material weight. And that's where you get into selecting your species of wood that you're going to be using. White pine is about half the weight of white oak or hemlock. So, white pine cut green is about two and a half pounds per board foot. White oak, I want to say, is somewhere between four and a half and five pounds. Hemlock is somewhere between four and a half and five pounds. And I'm using these three species because they're your most common for timber framing that you see nowadays. I mean, I've seen some frames cut out of elm. I've seen them cut out of maple, cherry. I mean, a good, decent, straight grain wood you can get away with using. Or, not that elm's a good straight grain wood, but I think you guys understand what I'm saying. So your dead loads are going to be different for white pine, they're going to be different for hemlock, they're going to be different for white oak, and they may be different for southern yellow pine. So that's where, I, I don't know if you guys can see, but that's where things are going to start to differ from what I am doing here on this structure. So white pine is not as strong as white oak. Structurally speaking, it's not as strong, but it's about half the weight so my dead load's a lot less. Now, white oak is very heavy. It has a very high moisture content and there's going to be a lot of movement in the frame after you build it. There's going to be a lot of twisting, cracking, checking. You have to be prepared for that. That's why you, you know, that's why you see when I talk about boxing the heartwoods. But, um, so we're just briefly touched on species selection. Probably what I'm going to do is write a real long article on the website, on my website, and uh, that's probably what I'll end up doing over the next week or so is just write a good long article on this in there and how you go about designing and planning. But I'm just kind of trying to give you a basic primer here so that you maybe have a couple things to get you started as far as your research goes to designing your own. So we've touched on species and what we have to look for with that, you know, you're figuring weights. Right now we're thinking about dead load. We're thinking about just how much is everything going to weigh. And I guess that's the best way I can put it. How much is everything going to weigh? We'll just simplify the last three minutes of this video into one, one question. So once you've figured out how much everything's going to weigh, you have to know the weight of your rafters. You have to know the weight of your floor joists, your tie beams, all that stuff. You need to know the weight of all of it. So I just want to tell you that up front figure that out and it's not hard to figure out guys you just have to it takes a little patience to sit there and figure that out once you figure out the weights of what everything's gonna weigh you need to figure out how much weight each framing member is going to have to support so we talk about tributary area so you know let me see so we want to talk about tributary area sorry the lights messed up so Pick on that floor joist right there. The tributary area for that floor joist is going to be from that center of that cavity to the center of that cavity and then from one tie beam to the next tie beam. That would be the area that that one floor joist is expected to support while it's sitting up there. Okay, does that make sense to you guys? So the middle of that cavity to the middle of that cavity from this tie beam to the other. So by figuring the square area of that tributary area, figure out the square footage for that tributary area, and then you multiply your pounds per square foot times that area, and that's going to tell you how much weight that one framing member needs to carry, what it needs to support. So it's kind of... Uh, so these are some basics. I'm not trying to scare you guys away from designing these yourself, but I'm just I, I just want you to understand how important it is that you plan this out, whether you're copying a design or, or whatever you're doing, 
it's just very important to plan these out. So Thomas lives in, he, he's in Georgia, okay? I'm up here in the Canadian border. My snow load is 60 pounds per square foot where I live. He probably has no snow load. So his rafters won't need to be as big as my rafters most likely. So you guys see what I'm saying, how things can change with that. Now if his rafters don't have to be as big, his purlin plates may not have to be as big and his queen pulse may not have to be as big to support the weight of that roof. As that reduces down in size, you get down to your tie beams, maybe they don't have to be quite as big because the dead load on them isn't quite as heavy. It's stuff like that that you have to consider. Now I'm, I'm not saying that it's going to be smaller, but I'm just saying those are the kind of things that you need to have to think about. I think what I'll do, I'm going to work on, I'll work on over the course of the next few days when I have time, I'll start writing a good solid write-up on this. I'll throw it on the website free, you know, it doesn't cost you guys a dime, just check it out if any of you are really curious. Um, but I just thought that was a really good, it was a good question that he asked. I've been asked it before. I hope that was a damn cat. Okay, good, it was a cat. <laughs> I could smell a skunk behind me somewhere. Hoping it wasn't a skunk, that'd probably get a million views. Dumbass gets sprayed by a skunk. But, so anyway, with all my rambling tonight and everything, I'm not getting a lot done here this week with all the rain and everything we've been having. It's that time of year, you know, so we're going to be back at it heavy this weekend. So maybe I can get you guys some better videos than what we've had the last couple ones. But I just wanted to get into a little bit of some of the design stuff. And as we can, once we're into this shop, I want to be putting a big whiteboard on there. So I'll be, be able to explain things a little better. I can actually draw it out for you guys. and You guys can see it. And then we can put it into practice while we're doing it. But... Uh, so I guess the moral of tonight's story, if you guys are looking to build one of these, it's good to understand it's good to understand some of the basic engineering principles behind these structures. Because if you do not understand some of those or how to arrive at those numbers you may not want to be designing it yourself. And I'm not telling you this to scare you away from it. I just you guys are going to put a lot of work into cutting these frames. You're going to have a lot of blood, sweat, tears in your heart into these things. You don't want it to fail. You just want to do everything in your power so it doesn't fail. So, that being said, I'm falling asleep again. <laughs> it's getting late again. I'll catch you guys later. I appreciate you watching. Um, we're going to be back into a lot more doing here over the next few days. Once the weather squares around and everything, kind of hard to get things done right now. So you guys take her easy and I'll catch you on the next one.